thought I would give you a little bit of background about that. Um, and maybe start by talking just about Jewish burial, um, which is a very, very important aspect of traditional Jewish life. And the Chevra Kadisha was always the people who bury the dead and, and prepare a body for burial were always the kind of elite of any um, Jewish community. Um, and the workman, so the workman circle is a kind of unusual phenomenon. I oh, yes, forget my notes. Um, and the question that I asked myself when I went to the cemetery with my little camera was, how do socialists, communists, atheists, religious Jews bury the dead? Um, for in, in many places, even people who are less or more assimilated, more country, less religious, still are kind of under the um, control of the local Chavar Kadisha because it's one of those things that the most religious part of the community often dominates. Um, so that when the, the Workman Circle uh, Cemetery uh, Foundation started in 1907, it was really a kind of um, first. And just a very short history of um, burial and modernization and acculturation. So, I mean, the, the whole question of Jewish burial was actually at the center of Jewish modernization um, and, and um, acculturation. It was, it was a debate that was carried out in the very heart of the Haskalah, for instance, the Jewish Enlightenment. And Moses Mendelssohn, who's the um, major Enlightenment figure of the Berlin Haskalah, um, Haskalah in Yiddish, um, got involved in, with the de in, in a debate about um, one of the ways in which there was tension between the Jewish religious community and the government. And the government basically objected to the practice of early burials. You know, or, or, you know that Jews traditionally bury the dead within 24 hours, sometimes the same day. Um, and the German government, among the rules that they tried to impose upon the Jewish community, was a three-day wait. And, oh, thank you. And why was that? Yes, exactly. Um, in case the person wasn't dead. Um, so, and the Jewish community felt as if this was a very important part of, of Jewish practice that they were not willing to relinquish. They also wanted Jews to be buried in coffins as opposed to just um, in a shroud, which was also traditional practice. It's still done in Israel, but not in America. Um, and Mendelssohn, what? It's not done. The shroud is not done in America. A shroud. A shroud. A shroud. No, we have to use a coffin. Uh, coffin. In the coffin. So, um, and Mendelssohn actually took the position that um, early burial was not important. That there was a range of Jewish practices around burial and that um, that Jews could safely um, bury the dead after, you know, that it, it wasn't a terrible um, transgression of Jewish practice to wait three days. And he got, he uh, drew the ire of the Orthodox establishment. This was one of the flashpoints in which Mendelssohn's traditionalism was called into question, although in you know, every other regard he was a perfectly observant Jew. And over this debate, you get the first of the kind of secular, less traditional challenges to cover Kadisha. And these challenges continue. Um, in the New World in particular, one of the functions of um, the Landsmannschaften, I'm sure you know, you know about the Landsmannschaften. It's Landsmannschaften for, does everyone know what a Landsmannschaften is? It's a, 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 an organization of people who um, all come from the same place, generally. So the Landsmannschaften took a, were a kind of alternative to the traditional Orthodox Dabur Kaddisha, Kaddishas, which tended to be located in synagogues. And the Landsmannschaften, among the services that they provided, were, um, were burials outside of the traditional Dabur Kaddisha system, also insurance and various other things, but a, a burial insurance was a, a, a big part of the services that they provided. So basically, until um, 1907, when the Workman Circle founded its own burial society, there were these two, um, and, and by the way, the Landsmannschaften were also fairly traditional in terms of their um, uh, adherence to Jewish practice, so the body should never be left alone, they tended to have burial fairly early, 
So why why did the workman circle um, why did the workman circle feel the need to have their own um, burial society among other reasons? A socialist organization. Problem. Any ideas? Or? To protect those that uh, did not have the money. It partly was a social service. Um, <coughs> There's another reason, which is, yeah. Burying non-Jews in the same cemetery. There are some non-Jews buried in the cemetery. The question of who can be buried according to Jewish law is, and where they can be buried, first of all, suicides. Um, the big problem with suicides, suicides are buried by the fence. Um, the Workman Circle prominently displayed uh, in the honor row, I'll talk about the honor row, there's at least two suicides. So there's one in the, the old Mount Carmel and one in and the, the among the biggest, most prominent um, gravestones are for suicides. So this would so even just that would not have been allowed. But also, I mean the main in reason Queens. was an incentive to Queens. join. Yeah. <laughs> 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 You're planning. <laughs> yeah. So um, Mount Carmel and where was the other one? The, the Mount Carmel, the new Mount Carmel, they're both um, they're, they're, they're uh, neighboring burial societies in, in, in Queens. It's actually the right of the border between Brooklyn and Queens. But then there are individual arbitrary branches that have little plots right. in different right. cemeteries, too, that are from that are long They're all over the country. Yeah. This was on the website last night. There's one in Northern California, too, apparently. At least I didn't investigate two. I think hey, my parents were buried in one Currently. What? My parents are buried in some of the Yeah, in Southern California. So you have, I mean, basically what you have is, they're very beautiful, and I really, I really recommend, and they're among the most radical places to look at Jewish burial practices, for reasons that I'll talk about, um, including this practice of writing your own epitaph, which was, you know, very, very popular among Yiddish writers in particular, but also Yiddish speaking politicians, etc. Um, so, so what you have really is a kind of living or dead, I don't know what to call it, um, set in stone anthology of some amazing Yiddish poetry that I just thought. You may get to this, but did non arbitrary plots uh, or cemeteries ban the use of Yiddish on the Mitzvah rather than the No, no. no. Okay. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of, when you go to the Mount Carmel Cemetery, um, you'll see that it's a beautiful cemetery, and it's it's really very. Um, there are even though it's a very very large cemetery. When you're driving along the BQE, you can see just yeah. this necropolis. Um, and this is a very Jewish cemetery, but it's all organized according to. Well, there are t lots and lots and lots yeah. of lots uh, of uh, cemeteries, and each cemetery is. You know, not that big. So, and surrounded by and, and, and surrounded by a fence or a wall, so you really get the sense of a kind of geography of the Jewish immigrant community. Um, and there are, now there are uh, a lot of new Soviet Jewish uh, burial grounds there. But basically, what you see is there are three varieties of ways in which Jews are buried in this particular cemetery. Um, they tend to be either in congregational cemeteries. So people buy a plot um, in their congregation, and those are also very often organized around families. So you're buried next to, you know, your spouse, and there's space for um, other members of your family. Um, or it's the the Landsmannschaften, in which case what you see is just the kind of strange geography where there'll be, you know, um, Bialystok next to, you know, right next to um, Kiev or. Some of them had to do with when the person died, they got, I think. Well, yeah. there's always the problem of who gets in and, and when you have to overflow. Yeah. And, and there are some just sort of general parts of the cemetery where people who don't have these affiliations can buy plots. But it's mostly organized according to plot. And what's so interesting about the Arbitering Cemetery is that it's, I mean, first of all, it has this architecture of the honor row and the people who are behind it. So we'll talk about the architecture of the cemetery. And really, this is the sort of thing where if I had it together, I'd show you my slideshow. But I have such a, well, whatever, I won't get into that. I do have some photos of it, um, very bad Did photos. Yeah. Oh, yes, there were more. Um, so what you have is, a first of all, a cemetery that's not organized 
either according to family or according to place of birth, which is interesting. So how, you know, on the one hand, it's like this kind of democracy of the workers, in which there, you know, there's sort of a, a union of the workers. I'll just say that the, the, there's a, a gate to the cemetery. If you look at it here, here's the entrance to the plot. A very beautiful gate, and those two balls are globes, and this, this is where, by the way, there's Lieberman on the right, a bust of Lieberman, I'll talk a little bit about him. He's the person who died first, who's in the cemetery, though his, he, he, was, he was initially buried in Syracuse, New York, in the 1880s, and he was brought to Honor Row um, to be part of, uh, what it says is Aaron Lieberman, um, the pioneer of Jewish socialism in America. He lived in America for all of three months before he blew his brains out with a gun. Um, and he, uh, but he was, he was a pioneer. I mean, they're a pioneer, I should say. Um, and he came trying to start the labor movement in America, one of the first ones in 1883, I think, um, and was made miserable by the conditions in America. And his activities never got off the ground. But he's remembered as the great martyr who was lost for the cause. So he's there in honor row. But the gate itself, the archway, um, do you know what it says on the archway? Maybe this is true of the one in Southern California. Arbiter von Alla Felker von Einitzel. Right. Workers of the world. Right. 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 I wanted to show you something interesting. I have here the epitaph of Sean Malay. You have the handwritten the version? The handwritten version. I found it at Yibo. Oh, interesting. And I noticed that you do have a few mistakes in this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not true. You had it translated. What? No, I, I, I think I translated it. You translated it. Okay. I had it in my, really, this mistake. Well, we okay. can't take that out. I'll show you. Uh, sure uh, the session. I'm not surprised. You see, that's why I tried to At hide. least it's not in stone, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, you know, I was typing it last night because none of the, I mean, the, the, this I mean, I took, my book. I was typing it, you know how the auto it corrects your mistakes? I kept typing garnished and I kept typing, correcting it to garnish. You what? <laughs> So my father, who is not a socialist, when, when we went to visit somebody's grave in that cemetery, said, <laughs> And the truth is, there is an attempt to talk about the democracy of death. So, I mean, it's interesting because you have the socialist notion of, of we're all the same and life and in death. And Shalom Aleichem, in his will, said he wanted to be buried among the simple people. Um, and then you have the, the, I don't know what you could call it, the, the inevitable capitalist hierarchical impulse of all people. So, and they're in this Workman Circle Cemetery, founded in 1907. In 1921, um, they decided to have something called an honor row, where the more important dead were visibly, um, had the biggest calls to. So talk about exactly how that happened. But one of the first things, first of all, this, this idea that um, Amadou Fernal felt that finding this was an appropriate thing to put over into a cemetery entrance is interesting. I mean, the, the, I mean, to me it's just interesting. What is, I mean, socialism has a lot of things going for it, but comforting people and making them not be afraid of death, and them that, uh, that, doesn't have much, that, it, that it doesn't have going for it. In other words, once it's approached to death, on some level, it, it, you know, where does it, how does it come to terms with that is, is my basic question. And does it face it squarely? Does it come up with, I would say it faces it squarely in some instances, as we'll see. And in other instances, it, it, it uh, kind of reverts to a kind of, I think, a kind of obfuscation, which is martyrology, which is old-fashioned Kiddush Hashem um, ideology. And, you know, the so, uh, uh, socialists also have, you know, first of all, pilgrimage is alive and well. If you go at any time, I've never been to the, uh, to the grave site without finding that there's so many little stones on um, yes. Shalom Aleichem's tombstone that you have to get rid of a few to put yours on. 
Um, so Shalom Aleichem still uh, visited as regularly as, I don't know, a Moroccan saint who uh, pilgrimage. So the practice of pilgrimage is still alive, which is, I think, interesting. One thing was Yiddish students make pilgrimages to, um, to, to the Workman Circle Cemetery. Just to see, I mean, what's interesting is that the most living place where you find Yiddish verse is in a cemetery. So, so they go to see, you know, this is, and, and, and the, I think the epitaphs are astonishing. I mean, one's more amazing than the next. I mean, and, and direct, and very unconventional also. I mean, you, there's no, I mean, there are some conventions, I and mean, there's plenty of, there's lots and lots of tombstones that say he gave his life to the workers, or, you know. Um, but first of all, where do you find images? I mean, what are the images that you find? What are socialist death images? And we know the, the traditional Jewish images at a cemetery, um, you know, this. This means I'm a Kohen because I can do that. No, um, it doesn't actually mean I'm a Kohen. Um, or a, a heart. I'm a Klingon. I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a Kohen. Klingon. Klingon. Yeah. Right, I'm a Klingon. If you're a Klingon. picture, if you're a Levite. Uh, right, a, a Levite. Or um, a, a, a candlesticks for a Jewish woman. In very highly conventionalized language, pay none for Ponik Bar. In the case of, I think in the Bhaktarama it says, Ponitman, here lies hidden. Oh. Because um, he didn't really die. It's the pain there's like five letters. Oh, to Yed Nafshot. And the prayer for the afterlife, or the, the not prayer, the, the, the sort of formulaic invocation for Tiyed uh, Nafshot Suro Ritzor HaChayim. So it's tough. Thank you. And actually, I should say that in the cemetery, uh, may his soul be wrapped in the bonds of everlasting life. I mean, everlasting life. So it's a kind. Of, you don't find, first of all, and very, you don't find any of this. <laughs> there's no ponik bar. There's no tianav shot suro b'torachayim. There's one thing that is it's interesting. Um, oh, and in, in the workman circle. What you do see is, um, and you don't see, you very often don't see the Jewish date of death, which is very, almost standard in traditional Jewish uh, punitive stones and why. Yeah, you have to know where the yard site is, and you know, if you lost the piece of paper, there it is on the tombstone. Um, the one thing that you do see, especially in the new Mount Carmel, which was founded in the, the early 1950s, is which does correspond also that you some, which crosses over between traditional religious burials and these secular socialist ones is Hey You know what Hey You is? No. Hashem Yikom Damam. So Holocaust survivors and the new Mount Carmel cemetery has quite a few uh, Holocaust survivors will very often include on their own grave sites the names of people that they know that were killed that were, did not have grave sites anywhere. So um, you'll see in my father's grave site, this, you know, you'll see like 23 other names. Um, you know, these very crowded grave sites and hey you Dalit, may God avenge their blood. And, and the hey you Dalit be letters that are yeah, the letters, it's code like for, Aberdeen, Aberdeen. it's code for, um, they got a bunch of blood, which is a feature of Hebrew, Yiddish speaking, Holocaust survivor culture, right after the war, um, and dropped out of Holocaust culture and translation. So, and it still appears um, in people being buried up to this day. So that's, so the, the, and basically if you want to say what, what's the difference between the, the older and the newer, the older Workman Circle Cemetery is really dedicated to socialism and Yiddish literature. So those two things together. And they're somewhat segregated. The people on the sort of, if you're facing the, the, the arch, on the right hand side tends to be politicians. And there's 37 people in honor row. It tends to be politicians on the left-hand side, it tends to be, or activists, or the left-hand side, it tends to be writers. But there's a few people that sort of cross that, you know, that are both. Um, let's in, see which, in which community did you say it's not traditional to write your own? 
In the traditional world, it's not traditional, it's right now. Okay. Okay. In, the, um, in, the socialist in the socialist world, it became a kind of fashion among Yiddish writers to write epitaphs. And some of them were numerous epitaphs. So Anna Margolin had, a, when they, she was carried, there were a choice of published poems called Epitaphia. So, um, and they chose one, but found the two, and according to David Roski's, they found her epitaph too disturbing to publish it, so they censored it. I mean, to inscribe it, so they censored it. Um, let me see what, what I didn't say about the, um, so yeah, I, I, another thing is Apikarsen sometimes have a hard time finding very own. So this was like a, a cemetery for Apikarsen, for heretics. Um, so right away, one of the first, so, so the, um, the Workman Circle really is a sacred space, and it, it has many, um, not just individual burial uh, sites, but also a, memor a memorial wall for um, the first uh, major one um, was uh, for the, uh, the women of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. So, um, Oh, but I should say the big, the big uh, seven, the big funerals in New York is another phenomenon that I should at least mention. I don't know if you know that it became really, you know, in Eastern Europe there was some pretty large funerals. Um, uh, 1935, the founder of Yeshiva Shkafli Lublin, there was some like quarter of a million people at his funeral. So there were, you know, there were there was a tradition of Jewish big funerals, but in in um, in the Lower East Side, because of the density of the population, um, these became extravaganzas. And because there was a kind of opening up of what a funeral meant in the secular world, you, didn't, you could prepare for a few days, you could really put on a good show, um, you have a, a, a real proliferation of these huge funerals. The first really big one in the Yiddish uh, secularist world was Jacob Gordon's in, I think, 1909. Um, there was, uh, I mean, uh, he, was, he lay in state in an open casket, which, is, as you know, is not Jewish practice. Um, Who's, in, what's his name again? Jacob Gordon, oh, yeah, the, Gordon. The, yeah, the, the, right. the uh, actor. Yeah. And if you know the culture of Jewish of Yiddish theater, you know that actors were, you know, they were idols, or were many idols, and, and, you know, the open casket, people wanted to really get as Gordon, close. Gordon was a playwright, are you talking, Jacob Gordon? Oh, Jacob Gordon, I'm sorry, Jacob Gordon was the playwright. Um, but also, like, you know, the theater culture, so it was like a, a, a it was an actor, but I forget. Jacob Adler, maybe Adler? Maybe it was Adler, who I'm thinking yeah, of. He was he would have had a huge following. He would have had a huge no. following, but I don't remember reading about his funeral. Tomaszewski also had, uh, had a huge yeah. funeral. Had a huge, huge funeral. My dad is buried in Mount Hebron Cemetery in uh, Queens. With the same, and, same... Well, I usually go there by automatic pilot mm -hmm. to his grave, and one day the radar wasn't working, and Reza uh, Harim, and I, I turn around, and there's Gordon and Adler right next to me. And it turns out that the, the, uh, the theater union cemetery uh, their plot is right there, and it's like go. It's better than going to Elvis Presley's. Uh, you know. yeah. I think Gordon is Gordon. Gordon in, is in there because there are some um, producers and theater people in the working circle. There's some uh, David Herman, David Herman, who was a theater producer who put on. Uh, you must know this. Who put on the most beautiful book apparently is. Um, so he has. And his tombstone is beautiful. Unfortunately, I think it's on the back. Unfortunately, it didn't come out. Oh, terrible. There he is, David Herman. Um, I love. He uh, he's he has a, a, a kind of inscribed um, the 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 Rebbe of Miracle and Conan and Leia on his tombstone. So um, so Gordon apparently the the among the. Among the, uh, the there's a huge musical production. I mean, there's like a six-hour funeral with uh, you know a hundred young boys singing Wagner. Apparently, was part of the. Uh, um, so somebody's got to write about this. The uh, and the Workman Circle, by the way, put out these little programs for you know with obituaries and and produced the kind of secular ritual 
around burial um, in which uh, people could take ideas from these in case you were burying someone who wasn't, you know, you, know, you didn't have a cast of people to participate in, 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 the, um, in the funeral. So, okay, so the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, um, that was, I think, I don't know if the date I wrote was the actual fire or, or the 20, funeral. March 25th, 1911 was the fire. So, yeah, that's what I had, March 25th, 1911 um, was the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, I think 156, mostly girls and women, young women. A lot of them, some Italian girls, but the majority of them, um, Jewish, um, died in this. I think you all know about the, I don't have to tell you about the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Um, the, there were three days of demonstrations and riots and the funeral was, a, was, was basically a protest march too. Um, and the largest funeral was for seven unidentified, the last seven corpses that were burned beyond recognition. No one could figure out who they were. I know you. Yeah. I can't remember Amherst. 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 So, um, <laughs> I mean, I know everybody else here, but I know you. Okay. Um, so there's a, they were buried, the seven, these seven corpses were buried together in, in the cemetery in the back, and there's a memorial wall telling the story about it. So right from the very beginning you have a kind of, the role is not only, um, you know, individual people, but the kind of martyrdom of the movement with the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire performing that function. And I'll talk about Ziegelbein, who's buried in the new Mount Carmel, who performs the same function as a as a martyr, as a Holocaust a martyr, a secular Holocaust martyr, and suicide actually. Also, um, who's in the new Mount Carmel, a little ways up the hill. So, so Shalom Aleichem, maybe we'll talk a little bit about Shalom Aleichem's tomb. He's important for a lot of different reasons, including being Shalom Aleichem, that's enough. But he's actually really strangely important to the architecture of the workmen. So really, you people, don't you know how to dance? Okay, you play an instrument, listen to the fun they're having. <laughs> <laughs> What's not fun about talking about cemeteries? So <laughs> we're all here preparing. <laughs> <laughs> right? So okay, there's clearly people here who know their their Yiddish dates. So when did Shalom Aleichem die? The date. And the day of the week? We don't have any Yiddish idiots among us. <laughs> you know. 1916 is open. March 15, 1916. The Ides of March, look at that. No, I'm sorry, uh, May. May, May, May. I'm a little dyslexic. The Ides of May. <laughs> um, he had one of the biggest funerals in New York history. Um, you can read a whole book about just the funeral by Jeffrey Chandler. I was looking for it. It's, it's somewhere on my shelf. I was like, bring you a photo or something. Some um, people said that he found it easier to die than to live in New York. He really did not want to be in New York. He didn't want to live in New York. He didn't want to die in New York. He was stuck in New York because of the war. He wrote in his will that he, if he died in New York, he wanted to be buried in Kiev. Um, and where he had come from before the war. Um, after the war, Kiev was the Soviet Union. Um, his family was trying to figure out what to do. He had a kind of temporary burial in the cemetery. And the workman circle approached the family. And the family was like, I mean, Sean Lesham was one of these people who wasn't entirely just aligned with the workman circle. He was also a Zionist. Um, his, he has one of the few graves. His son-in-law, um, uh, Berkovich, what's his first name? Yudal and Berkovich translated his, his epitaph into Hebrew, and it, on the back you can see his full name. His wife Olga has like a little line, she's buried somehow in the same plot. I don't know exactly how they do that. Um, <coughs> this, is, this is a few wives like that. I have to say that being married to a socialist is talk about problems of de de democratic burial, we're not all like, 
the, 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 honor, the honor row, I think, is almost entirely male, or maybe it's entirely male. It might be entirely male, except for the little wives that somehow, I don't know if they're on top of their husbands or underneath their husbands, or, but they get a little line on the bottom of the gravestone. At least in the Frum cemeteries, they get their own <laughs> socialism. It was a good idea, what can we say? Um, so in his Sabbat, in Shalom Sabbat says, he wants to be buried you know, among the, the, the ordinary Jewish working folk um, in Kiev. So they're trying, the family's trying to figure out what to do. The workman's circle um, approached the family in 1921 with an offer they can't refuse. And they have this idea, which is, why don't they start a, an honor row? They'll put Shalmalech, they'll bury Shalmalech and they'll rebury him or move him over. I don't know how far they have to move him. Um, and put him in what they were going to start, which is what they were calling an honor row. Um, in which the celebrities of the Yiddish-speaking world would be buried. And apparently, you know, the combination of the difficulty of going back to Kiev and whatever, it was an offer that the family either, you know, couldn't or didn't want to refuse. And Salman Lechem was the first citizen, denizen, of Honor Row. Um, and he actually had it all to himself, I think for a year at least. Um, and it's now full and filled up in the, uh, in the late, in, in the early 1950s, I think, Ab Kahan, who was squeezed in right at the right of the gate, um, was the second to the last person buried there. I forget who the last person buried there, he, he wasn't as famous as Ab Kahan. Um, so that's how you got an honor row. It was uh, family socialist politics. I would find it difficult to imagine that the honor row was not created the way it was through some sort of factor involved with plot pricing policy. Yes, exactly. Um, exactly. <laughs> it seems, I mean, I don't think that they extracted money from people. I think it was, for one thing, they, one of the things that they, they had a, I mean, you put in money into a burial uh, society and then you just got, I think they decided where you were. And there's a very clear architecture, so, um, socialist pioneers and major writers of the first generation, including um, Morris Rosenfeld and, you know, who's like the, the sweatshop poet, um, are in the first row. And then the, the youngest... Um, I know they moved around from one newspaper to another. Okay, there was a big argument about who am I thinking of? Morris Rosenfeld, I'm pretty sure. That's Morris Rosenfeld at the end of his life became a communist. Yeah. Left the Socialist Party, became a communist. And his. There was a, a near riot at the funeral about where he was going to be buried. It was another, his family stayed loyal socialists. And it was one of those things, we have the same thing in our family, ah, he was either blissful, you know, it's like, he was, he was pretty old, he died in, I think in his early 90s. So the, I mean, we could see what the dates are, but the family was not, was wanting to have him buried at the, at the Workman Circle Cemetery. And there was a spot in the, I think he died in 38. He long outlived his, his yeah. poetic fashion. Ah, so that was after the Hitler. So whatever, I mean, he, he, was, he wasn't necessarily, so, and this was, by the way, this was not uncommon. The communists um, came to the funeral and threw eggs and, um, so there was, at the socialists who were in charge of the burial. But he'd been paying into this workman circle policy, so, I mean, so there was like economic factors and whatever. I mean, the working circle felt that they, they owed him. He had, like up until the last year of his life, he was a socialist. So, um, so yeah, there's, so he's right in the first row. He's, I think, two or three to the left of Shalom Aleichem, um, which is appropriate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> where, was, where were the communists there? What? Where were the communists there? Yeah, where did they get there? No, the communists. The Orden had its own plot. The international yeah. order. They have, they have, they have a plot also. I'm sure they have a plot. I don't know if it's in the, this same. There's like a group of cemeteries, Mount Clavero, Mount Carmel, Mount. They're all Jewish, 
Um, and there are little, I, mean, I, I would be very surprised if there isn't a, a communist burial uh, site, but I, I didn't see it and I don't know anything about it. Um, so who else is there? Uh, see, Mayor London is, is yes, there? Yes, 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 who is a big political. He was a congressman. He was the first socialist congressman, I guess from New York. Yeah. Huh? Um, he's in the, you know, he's in the honor road. Um, Barth Vladek. He died in 1926, Mark Vladek, the founder of the American Labor Party. Um, Lieberman is there. I already told you about Lieberman. There's a bust of Lieberman. Um, I.J. Singer is there, but not I.B. Singer, who's not a socialist. He's buried in New Jersey. He's des just desserts. For his, um, <coughs> his, um, just desserts for... <laughs> I don't know if it's the right way. I mean, but first of all, the Honor Row closed in 1951, and Honor Row in the new Mount Carmel is a totally different story, and it's a lot of people from Europe, a lot of Bundists is in new Mount Carmel. It's basically the Holocaust Memorial. He wouldn't have been in. You wouldn't have felt comfortable. So, <laughs> so he's okay. Um, You're talking about the Mount Carmel in New Jersey. The deal. No, it's, not it's a called the Cedar Park. He's in Cedar Park, which is in Emerson, New Jersey. Who knows? Emerson. Kind of Prince. Yeah, I don't know New Jersey. I know the Newark Airport. No, it's Emerson. <laughs> He's not in the Newark Airport. Two towns right next to each other. Isn't that funny that we don't all know? It feels like we should know where someone like Isaac Shelley is. We don't know anything about New Jersey. New York. They have to come to us, right? We don't go to them. It's Except there are a lot of the, Orphan Circle grave sites on the left in New Jersey. Side. There are a lot of Orphan Circle grave sites left in New Jersey. Right. Left, yeah. That's where everybody in the Orphan Circle gets buried. Well, that's all. That's that's the, that's that's yeah, right. 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 So, um, let's see what else. So it's interesting just to see, I mean, I'm sorry that these, this came out. I didn't realize, I thought, oh, this is good, that's legible, and then I made copies of the copies. Ah, and they're right. illegible. Here's Aaron Lieberman that I talked about. Um, I missed the very beginning, aside from the fact that you pioneered this cemetery. He was brought to, um, he was brought to Honor Road from Syracuse in the 30s by the, um, someone remembered that really, who's the first socialist, who should we have as a founding figure, is some so they snook, that they, that, yeah. they brought his body from Syracuse, reburied him with great pomp and ceremony, third over from the arts. So, and he, he's the guy. I don't actually know too much about him. I don't think anybody really did. But he served the, every, he, everything needs like a founding father. Okay. So, um, and, and he, he, he served as that founding father despite in his own life not having any success in American soil. Um, okay. Are there Workwood Circle cemeteries in other countries? Israel or I think Europe? so. You know, there's a site called the Workman Circle Burial Society Cemetery. Is there one? Yeah. Yeah, I was just saw it last night okay. trying to find. I mean, what I really was hoping for is a list instead of trying they to look at. I've asked, and the people in the cemetery department haven't a clue as to why. The you only way you can find. I mean, they don't understand that this is a text, yes. and that they need to yeah, provide exactly. the text. They, they, they can't. The way they have it is they assume that people are coming to look for their relatives. So you put in a name and then you find where they are. But that's not what you want. What you want is a picture of the whole cemetery. Who's in honor row or why? And if you don't know their name, then it's not going to, you know, if you're not a relative, then you don't know their name, then you don't know. So you have to know who to look for. So you actually have to go there. So much I mean, there should just be a website that treats this like a kind of... Well, that would well, be they are many there, there cares. But there are well, they, they're not there. into that. They're, I speak for the ring isn't they don't into understand that. But what there's the beginning yeah. of a database called the Jewish Gen Online Worldwide Burial Registry, and it has more, about a million and a half listings, but also there's a way, and this is worldwide. I mean, you, you get surprised, like, oh, there's Colorado, there's Wyoming, and there's Israel. You know, you look for a certain name. But also the Jewish Genealogy Society of New York 
uh, on its website. I don't know if it's browsable or just searchable, but it's basically a list of which Monsman shaft has plots in which cemeteries in the New York area. So that's you can certainly and you can a look list. and you can see which ones say Arbiter Ring Branch right. or whatever. I saw a list of around fifty. Um, yeah, but they're society. not annotated. This has not been done with the LITPs. Right. If you could, it, I mean, I know Kahan is there, so I type in Kahan, you actually get a picture of the gravestone, and I'm like, okay, that was not so if the cemetery office says his name. He doesn't need any will give you, sometimes the cemetery office has a map of the plot itself, not just the whole grounds, but the plot itself with who is in which grave, and if you're, you know... That's what you need. Okay, so, so it, 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 they don't make your life totally easy, but... Um, so these are some of the people that are on there. Um, behind them are, you know, the Junge, the Inzatisten, the, the, the next generation of the kind of the, the Yiddish modernists are behind them. And the more famous ones tend to be. So this is like um, literary generation um, and the younger kinds of activists or the, the more local activists. So that, that's how they set up their hierarchy. And, um, so I just thought we would look at some of these uh, uh, epitaphs. And some of them are very famous. I mean, Shalom Aleichem's epitaph, I, I don't know where I found it. I put it in the... Um, <coughs> this is one word for the sacred claim. But you have... And uh, it's the handwritten by Shalom Aleichem. This is all handwritten by Shalom Aleichem. I, I turned to evil. And I was sitting in the archive there for weeks on an end. And, um, but, but then you would still have to check the gravestone because it's possible that... Right, that they all did yes. it. Ah, which, which so that's what the mistake is. Okay. Could, be, could be they all Why don't you read the... Why did what you have? Here it says... Dolik da yi da pashitur. Yeah, Zai, you yeah. see where we are? One, yeah. one uh, paragraph that they totally left out, and mm -hmm. this is what he wrote. Reb Zaijet Moichel, Sa'al Tiraich, Anu Reb Yik Medar Faichudn, Shulam Malaychem Vestir Doch, Nu Likter Du in the Reb Pagrudn, Gwena Yida Freilachet, Geshribn Yiddish Taich Farbaibet, Un, um, it doesn't say positive, it says a pushit. A pushit. A pushit. A pushit. A A pushit. 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 Und darf gewend der Eulem hat gequält, geklatscht und pflegt sich freien, hat er gelacht, hat er weiß. geweint, das weiß nur Gott, besorgt, als keiner so nicht sehen. Well, it clearly was too long for them to hear. Right, so they left yeah. out the first paragraph. So, so do you want to translate the first paragraph? The difference is the first that. paragraph is Reb, Reb Zeitchen Moichel, Reb Zaychet Moichel, you know, he doesn't know who is going to come in front of him. Sparty Reich, what are you rushing? Anu Rebid Medar Pachudu, we need you. Shulem Aleichem Weister Doch, or Nu Lichter Du in the Red Pachudu. Shulem Aleichem, you very well know. So here he is, buried in the ground. Gewes Naida Freilicher. He was a, a Jew, a, 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 a happy one. Geschrieben Yiddish Teich, a Bible. Yiddish Teich, there was a book, the, the, usually the prayer books or the Chumashim or whatever were translated and they were called Yiddish Teich. It was a Yiddish German translation. Actually, Yiddish comes from German. They called it Yiddish Teich. The second name for Bible. Because the women, traditionally, I don't have to tell you about the chauvinist uh, parts of, of our Torah. <laughs> what can I say? Maybe not the Torah, but the later writing. 
So uh, Yiddish Taich, they had special writings for, for women, and some of it wasn't so very elevated. Uh, you know, Yiddish Taich is a kind of old-fashioned way of talking about Yiddish. Yiddish I mean, he knows the word Yiddish. It's a, it's a, it's a folk anachronism, which is typical of Shomo. No, well, because... because a simple people, translation. No, this was right, a simple this translation was a, Yiddish. It was not a word that Shomo like invented. This was a word common. Yiddish type, she meant uh, that Senerena was in Yiddish type, you know, okay. Also, uh, so what did I say? Gebein Ayida push it. Yeah, we had, the rest of it we have. Man. Okay. So, so it's right. not exactly the same. And exactly now the interesting thing is that he is he's right. writing a letter to a friend of his. <coughs> And he writes to him exactly what he wants. Uh -huh. he, he and the has to change it later. Uh, and he possibly. himself might have changed it at a later date Could to, the, to the version that appears on the stone. So it's, it's really Could hard to think it. it. It's quite possible that if you copied it from the stone. I, lo I love that first. But, but the other yeah, thing yeah. is when you, yeah. when you try to design um, a, a stone, there's only so much that will fit, really. So if he had seven verses, and they could only fit just No, his, uh, his tombstone is yeah. what about one this is seven but this four. Is the four, four but, verses. But look at, there, yeah, there are only room there for about three, three verses. Yeah, but it's a whole three feet of probably because you got a bigger stone. <laughs> well, it costs, it costs for a letter. These things are not It costs the same. for a letter. If you don't like it, and you spend money. Right. <laughs> Maybe that should be the new thing. I, I love that he addresses the person going by and, and it, it, it's so malachim, right? This, this notion of Yiddish as communicative. You're still talking. You know, you're, you're, you're dead, but you're still talking. He can never shut up. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you think of this as, a, as an epitaph? And you have you have a lot of it here. It's poignant. Yeah. Yeah. Never. Never. Yeah. I mean, the fingerprint is sort of chronicling the death of the civilization, you know, the East European shadow of the civilization. But I've never seen anything where he basically said I'm depressed. You know, I mean, he, no, that. he's unlike, uh, unlike Mendel, Marcus Sturm, or some of the other writers who were very bitter and sarcastic. Shalom Aleichem was, I mean, to me it seems as though he was 50 years ahead of his time at least. He just, he realized that he can no longer go back. He was no longer a practicing. Jew. But he realized that it sort of threw away the baby with the bathwater in some sense. There was much, much nostalgia that comes up. He renders the room, uh, the, the, whatever his name was, I forget, senior moment. He'll come to me. But the love that he invests this individual with is really very rare. And it shows the contrast, the warmth that he saw in the tradition. He didn't want to discard everything. But how about the way this other writers did? I mean, this is interesting. This is a picture of. I mean, one of the obvious things to say about this is that it's a persona. Like Shalom Aleichem, you know, even when he's being buried, you know, even that he's still so deprecating. He's yeah. I mean. He loved. Here's this guy who had a funeral. funeral. He loved the Jewish language. He loved. It was a great deal of love. And you right. And what he he's saying here? That he lost a lot by becoming a secular Jew. He realized that the secular world. It, it wasn't that he criticized here and he embraced everything there. He, there was a lot that he yearned for that he realized that we are leaving behind. He's the he, war, yeah. the whole Your last line really matches the last line. He wrote it all. Besides, kind of all the things. Yeah, besides, but how does he write after besides? Besides, he writes after besides. And he, this, this goes in secret, no one would see. All right. Besides, this ends in secret. This idea that you're going to get at the real yeah, soul. Actually, right. Yeah. It like that. So, he's saying that uh, he was going to but here give Andrew Spicer got besot as kinder's though. 
Um, Shalom Aleichem, let me just paraphrase, despite the fact that liter for literary critics, paraphrase is heresy. But we're all heretics here, so... Um, not because of He's saying, you knew me. First of all, this, this presentation as a simple pre-modern do for a man who was thoroughly modern is interesting, who had a funeral that attracted a quarter of a million people, um, you know, closed down New York traffic. We could walk to Queen. He didn't know um, about that funeral. So there's a self-presentation as kind of an anachronistic, it's a, it's a throwback to, to, to pre-modern Yiddish, um, that's Yiddish Teich, for Weiber, for Prost and Folk, this whole um, kind of self-presentation. And then added to that is, yeah, people thought I was funny, but I was suffering silently. And giving you a kind of a three, almost three-dimensional look, because here's the outside, which is a humorist, and the, or a journalist, and then the inside, where he's like, a, you know, crying through his tears, but that itself is a self-presentation. So there's these kind of layers of, you know, you, you peel the onion of who he is. Um, and, and, and the fact that he's called Shalom Aleichem on his tombstone, his, his, his real name, Shalom Rabinovich, is on the ink, his, his, you know, Berkovich put in his Hebrew translation. So, but this is also the way he wanted to, the, the way he wants to present. Right, right, he wants to present so himself. So, there's, you know, it's, it's he's more, still telling, telling this more complex than that. That's right, he's really, behind his, you know, happy face is, a, is, a, is his crying face, and behind the crying face, is it happy for, you know, whatever, you know, yes, no and behind doing. all that is uh, Sean Lovinovich was writing this right. for the world to remember. Yeah. Right. So, um, did did yeah. you write this to be it's posted in Kiev or New York? Uh, when he wrote it, was he thinking about Kiev? Maybe? I think he was thinking of Kiev. And he also, as he said, he was very explicit that he doesn't want to be buried with great ceremony and he wants to be buried. I mean, to that extent, if you want to find a kernel of truth, then the kernel of truth is, um, you know, a, a kind of democratic wanting to be with ordinary people when he does exactly what wasn't given to him. Um, so, I mean, this, just this idea of a complicated literary self-presentation in which, first of all, it's, I think in, in, in David Brosky's uh, essay, this essay about this, he calls he, he said he was showing, he takes students to the cemetery biannually, which I still don't know if that means twice a year or every other year. <laughs> <laughs> One of those two. Yes, every other year. Every other year, that's odd. Why is that semi annual? Semi annual. Semi -annual Nobody knows that. Any other is biannual. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so biannually. And he says he takes them and, he, and, he, and one of his students commented that it, there are almost no actual names among the writers, it's just like one pen name after another, and um, that the student said it's like the Yiddish Witness Protection Program. <laughs> 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 So on the one hand, you can say which there's is, no sense. Which thanks to Stalin was true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the things that might be interesting about Sean Malachim's will, he mentioned in his will that on the anniversary of his death, he wanted there to be a joyous celebration where there would be readings of what he had done. And uh, it has gone on to today. And for many years, he was met uh, in the house of Belle Portman, who was his granddaughter. And Belle Portman who was an English teacher, also up the wrote staircase. Up the Down Staircase, where it's a film. And she's now uh, in her late 90s, and uh, they still get together, but no longer in her house. And I want to tell you something, I've never been in a home in New York quite like hers. Uh, it's on Fifth Avenue, overlooking Central Park. Does it have a down staircase? And, no, <laughs> what it has is you go, in, you go into the lobby, the school, right? and then you get into the elevator after you're called up. And when you uh, get up to the floor where you're supposed to get off, you don't get off into any hallway. Then you ring the bell and you go right into the apartment. And when I went into the apartment, there is a long, long room uh, that on the left-hand side, there are four bedrooms and kitchens, etc. And this long room overlooks the park. They had 150 people there and you 
couldn't touch anybody if you reached out with both hands. Uh, and so she still keeps it up, but no longer in her apartment now. They meet at the, uh, at the synagogue. And uh, I want to tell you something. If you ever want to think of anybody who's as close as possible to Helen Hayes, that's what she is. Wow. Uh, so uh, very remarkable. Yes. But it's all joyous. Tevye gives good what residuals. Tevye gives good residuals. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's interesting. Although, yeah, she's still getting that money. Yeah. The, the Shalom Aleichem, the, the ceremony around his death was very interesting because he's really someone that united a lot of different segments of the Jewish community. And he had some connection to a Lanzmannschaft organization called the Leraslav or something? Perius Lavl. Yeah. So they, they actually took charge of the, of the um, Tahara, the, the, the purification of the body was done by, you know, Cherub Kadisha, Orthodox men. And then they had Shemira, which is the guarding of the body after the death. And this is where people were like, okay, this is Shalom Aleichem. You guys know how to purify a body, but we can watch it. And he was uh, watched for 24 hours by a hundred secular Yiddish writers who <laughs> took turns of secularists, like literally secularists, doing Shemira of Shalom Aleichem's body. So um, it was a real compromise, which, which I think is very appropriate for Shalom Aleichem. So I didn't, we don't have so much more time left, so let's, let's read a little. Oh, I didn't talk at all about Ziegel, um, Ziegelblum's time. Here, let's pass some of these around. I hope we have enough. Can you identify the epitaph to the word is uh, in the village? Maybe we should do, let's do uh, Anamar Golan, and then we'll do Ziegelblum. We'll end with Ziegelblum, which is very touching. So Anamar Bolin, I, um, Anamar Bolin, as I said, she has a few, her, the one English published epitaph is not actually the epitaph that's on her grave. Anyone else need one? So she had something called epitaph. I was like, oh great, I could do Xerox it from the modern book of, the, of Yiddish poetry. And last night I realized, no, 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 that's not what's on the grave. So I actually had to type out my notes. Um, there's some kind of, David Roski says that, Anamar Golan's, um, they, they, they censored the first two lines of Anamar Golan's um, epitaph. Um, and Anamar Golan, by the way, another pen name. Though she has, unlike a lot of these people, she has her, her, her actual name underneath, Rosa uh, I thought she was married to. That was a married thing, right? Well, she has the, the, her maiden name, Laban's Brian, and then Iceland. I think that's her husband that she left for Ruben Iceland. This is a woman and who was abandoning her husband, husband and child and went off with another Yiddish poet. Yeah. I don't remember, a wonderful Yiddish poet who I think has the best epitaph. I don't know, there's no award for the best epitaph as far as I know. But, you know, Shom Aleichem has a pretty great epitaph. Um, I think hers just wins hands down. And this, uh, you know, you can read, there's some beautiful, beautiful epitaphs here. I think I have Hay Levick's epitaph here. I, let, let, actually, hey, let is so. Look, uh, Daniel Charney's, which is very funny. Um, does anyone want to read that? I'm sorry about the, about the transliteration. Does anyone, let, let's read Daniel Charney and Hey, Levitt, and I'm not going. Does someone want to read how, how good are is someone's transliteration skills? I'll <laughs> do it. Thank you, Charney. Harvey. Yeah. Keine the maiden himself. Wir wasten dem Unheil von Ein, no, 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 that's not, that, start. Oh, God, that's the spell check that changed me. <laughs> start to start. Gornish, Gornish, Gornish. Start. Start. Ein Stau, 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 Oh, a oh a, 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 yeah, so Sheikh, he, he turns Sheikh into spat. To rhyme with baguette. To rhyme with baguette, so it doesn't mean spat. And Sheikh just means too. I guess a, a kind of special collar. Referring to the tux of the times. Right. It would be a stiff A stiff collar like that. So um, no one knows how he'll reach his end or how he was baguette. One dies in his sleep with a divine kiss and a shika, the other in cholera and spats. So, just some comments about this as an epitaph. Yeah. I, 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 
Lily Lyric and two stone <coughs> are now, so what was I all in my prime of life? Where I am now, you soon shall be prepared for death and follow me. I mean, he, this is a little That's like a good one. This, is this was, it was either 19th century or or this 18th century, but I see that actually. I think yeah, well, and it's it's aggressive. I mean, it's, it's very like, aggressive. Don't, don't feel superior to me. I don't remember poetry, <laughs> but that yeah. stuff. You know, yeah. yeah, it's sort of life as a crapshoot, for me. But you know, it, it, there's no Except reason to it. There's no rhyme or reason to it. What happens yeah. when you're living? What happens when you're dying? It's interesting that it's it's a kind of. I mean, one of the things about an epitaph is you're writing something and you don't know the end of the story. Yeah. And this is one that says we don't know the end of the story. I think. I mean. It's somewhat, to me, it's kind of... Do we know when in their lives, as in how close to their deaths? Some of them we do. Anna Margolin wrote, the, the epitaph that actually appears on her tombstone, she wrote 30 years before she died. So, she was getting ready. Um, she was prepared. She was somebody who did her taxes in March. Um, no, no, this is, she, she really loved the genre, it's clear. Um, in the case of Dan Attorney, I mean, what's interesting is that the there's some religious language. I said that you know the secular language and Yiddish language brought together in a very interesting way. Um, and what does it mean to die in your slip of the kiss? Well, the there's a you know it, religious folklore about death says that some people die with the kiss of God. It's the best way to die. Miriam. Except in the in the in the in the, in the I think in the Cetarena it says except that we didn't want to say that she died with the kiss because it's not so nice because God is male and she's female so we cover that over but it means to have the best possible death which also means to die in your sleep so it's a kind of interesting secularization of a religious idea but it's still a kind of memory of of a, of a religious language of death. Um, no, dying with your boots on, this is the sort of, I guess, Yiddish secularist uh, equivalent. It sounds like having a good time. Is yeah! That That's the yeah, you're out drinking. I mean, how does that happen? You know, you're, you're, you know, maybe that's better. So it's almost a commentary on, I mean, this question that I ask is, how do the secularists bury the dead? How do they approach death? What are the ways in which religious ideas are borrowed or religious ideas are made fun of or religious ideas are just ignored or um, you know what are the images that are used I mean one of the interesting things about I didn't talk so much about the images because I mean they're so hard to see but the whole range of images that don't appear in for instance the the German Jewish assimilated Jewish cemeteries which have a lot of classical Greek and Roman busts and, and um, pillars what would you say <laughs> My eternal home, that's it. So what's the color on the stats? I don't understand that. I, I think it's out on the town. Out on the town, alive. Think of, alive. Oh. Think of it in town, the New Yorker. <laughs> yeah. Oh. How do you want to die? <laughs> okay, so we don't have so much time and I want to get to Margolin. So let's yeah. hurry past these dead people. Well, they're not going to mind. Move on okay. to, um, let's talk about Levick. Ich liege auf der Decke und her wie mein Stern geht über mein Namen zum Haar von die Stern. It's interesting religious, uh, yes. quasi-religious language. Yeah. I kept wanting to change that to Stern. Um, it's very interesting. I lie covered over and hear my own star conveying my name to the Lord of Stars. <laughs> what do you make of this as a modern Yiddish poem, basically? Well, whoever the Lord of Star is, it's not spelled out, it's not necessarily religious, it's poetic. Yeah, it's poetic, it's a kind of translation of, and it doesn't say that I'm not under the dirt, but somehow part of me is a star. Yeah. yeah. Um, my name, it's a kind of... I'll be remembered, I'll be, yeah. uh, I'll be read, people will be saying my name and... Uh, yeah. And, and reading my works. Yes, which they are. As I said, there's a kind of paradox. This is, you know, it's like what people always talk about: is Yiddish a dying language? Is Yiddish dead? You know, if, in that case, it's sort of appropriate that, which is in some ways a, a, a problematic metaphor, and uh, that 
I mean, there's all sorts of ways of, of arguing with it, that maybe it's not true, whatever. But that the Yiddish cemetery turns out to be, you know, one of the places that's the richest and liveliest and, 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 and to me, most astonishingly direct cemeteries I've ever seen. So, okay, Anna Margolin. And you have to explain to me why they got rid of the first two lines, which, you know, according to Roski's, is because it was too unbearable. Does so, does someone want to read the English? Does he quote those two lines? He quotes them, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's available in some collection of Yiddish verses. I couldn't find it scrambling around in my bookshelves on Friday. Does someone want to read the Yiddish? The, the, the English. Thank you. <laughs> The use of mist here, would somebody explain that? Because to me that means that means, uh, mist means garbage or worse, so that's why I... Mist is more like dung. Is that's right, exactly what I'm saying. It's worse than garbage. That's why, it, yeah, it's manure. It's Shit! I, that's I, right. That's I translated I, this myself once, so I couldn't find my own translation. I translated a shit. That's She's exactly. somebody who who um, would use that term in her tombstone, on her tombstone. Well, that's, it's just that just but it doesn't have the same. It's not the same connotation as shit. Yeah, it's dumb. It's no, no, it what no, no, but that's, that's it's in English. It's in German, no, it's in English. In it's German, it's in German. It's in German. It's in Yiddish. It's garbage. I mean, well, it's garbage. Yeah. Just, it's garbage, it's dung, it's manure, it's all of that. It's, 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 strictly it's, on, it's a nicer term though than that. And I like it better than the epitaph that we have here, the one that isn't on the tombstone, but that's in the Penguin Book of Modern Yiddish Verse called Epitaph. Um, which, uh, maybe should we read that one too? Which is mm -hmm. much less edgy. <laughs> and it doesn't, I mean, one of the ways it's less edgy is that it implies mm -hmm. that people are going to be talking about her. And this one is. Sorry. Um, so, could someone read that one in, in, in Yiddish? There you have actual Yiddish. I'm sorry, it's small. For some of the, for some of us, that's more of a problem than for others. You see where we are? In the middle. It's you gotta find the middle here of. Um, you talking about the English? The or the the, the Yiddish that sell is in. Sie hat doch geben sich nicht, nicht gekannt ihr teure Gemüt, ist sie gegangen durch den Leben. Okay, I'm sorry, I screwed that one up. That's the sale as the hot is in tight, the shits the crime at Hoyle Hent, the spire, was the zeal given for Troit, and in eigenen fire for Gebrent, and we in showing from Ibermut, hot sin at God, got the shell gewerkt. The teeth is only in hot dust blood. The swear in hot and English. It's a common English. It's a strat. It's a strat. The swear in hot English. It's swearing. It's swearing. It's swearing. It's swearing. It's dwarfs. 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 Marshall Falk. Small men, but it's not. Not quite the same thing. It's interesting. Here she. Um, the the have, have the, so she makes you think petty men, you know. That's right. Small as in petty, but this is actually very small in stature. Say that, okay, so say that she couldn't forgive herself for her dark moods, so she went through life with apologetic steps. Say that until her death she guarded with bare hands the fire entrusted to her, which she finally burned. And say how in spirited hours she struggled hard with God, and how her blood sank deep. And small men ruined her. I like dwarfs better. Well, I don't know. Isn't that 
she's more wistful than what she said. Well, it, in some ways, she lets herself off the hook in, the, in, the, in this epitaph. And in the epitaph, she basically, she blames no one but herself. And also say, she imagines that someone's going to be talking about it here and here. And, and in the other epitaph, it's like, don't she did it all. say nothing. Here is this. Um, any other comments on this? Do you know when this one was written, as opposed to the other one? This was from the 30s, and she died in the 50s. I, um, okay. But she didn't publish for years and years. And by, right. by the 30s, she was essentially done as a yeah. poet. So maybe it was even, I know it was 30 years before she died, so maybe it was even from the 20s. Which one was so from the 20s? The, 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 the one that became her tombstone. She, be, she published which one became? Book. Which one came first? I, I wasn't able to discern. Um, maybe I could figure it out. That would have taken a little research. Um, I my I, I like it better that the second one is the one is the one that ended up on her on her tombstone. I think it's the better poem. I think there's a very um, the, there's still something romantic about an artist keeping a kind of flame going that's made more direct. Um, in, in this, in, in, in the epitaph on the tombstone. There's also something amazing about, just like, let's look at the first slide. The cold marble breasts and the narrow bright hands, the shattered face, the dishonored soul has quit the cage. The notion of a body in decay is not normally part of <coughs> the literature of tombstones. In other words, the body is decaying under the ground, but we don't want to think about that, especially not for a great writer and poet. Their spirit, their name, their memory, their whatever, that'll live forever. She manages to bring a kind of living truth about who she is to an image of a decaying body or a broken body. I mean, this notion of, I also think the notion of a soul quitting the cage. First of all, that the rib cage. <clears throat> it's a literalization of something that we. I mean, the rib cage is. We don't think of it as a cage. <coughs> the notion that your rib cage is like in some way literally a cage is such a powerful image. What did she die of? I want to say tuberculosis, but well, I'm not making that. Everyone, yeah. everyone yeah. all the poets died. Yeah. 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 Wrong, wrong. Except case. now, now they died. Yeah. 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 Right. But she's writing this one. She's still a young woman, and she's writing about herself with a kind of extreme self-hatred, um, which is I don't know. It's, it, I think it's a completely shocking. There's also shocking. Yeah, it's a very depressive. Right. Maybe she, she looks so dysfunctional. You know, in some ways, my life was awful. But I, it's about it's about masochism. It's about a kind of psychological masochism, which I have to say is not you know usual among you know tombstone poetry. She's and she's describing masochism and, and the kind of revulsion from the body in a way that both is a kind of powerful psychological self-portrait and frighteningly accurate about what's going on underneath. In some way, um, the, you know, the word soul leaving the body is, you know, some remnant of traditional vocabulary about death. But, you know, the, the, how should their Geschenter guys you know, the, the, the cursed, the, uh, how does she put it, the, the dishonored soul. Um, so the soul also is kind of wrapped up in this, I think, horrific and powerful um, uh, image of a self. And it's also contrasted with the, the cold, uh, complete uh, materiality of the of the first line image, bright hands and marble yeah. breasts. And that's amazing. The idea, first of all, the marble breast. I mean, that's such a complicated poetic image because, on the one hand, it's like rigor mortis. It's 
it's cold-heartedness, it's, it's a lack of human warmth on the, on the sort of, and it's the monument itself. And, 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 and that she manages to get all that. So, okay, so you write this unbelievable poem, Yiddish poem, and I think you win the prize. I mean, that's the other, the, the, the strange thing about it is that it's the most, you know, without being entirely secular, without being, I know I'm not going to live forever, with maintaining a certain kind of religious imagery, she produces the most daring poem and by the way, she's five rows back. She wasn't one row back. I don't know how they, she got back. I was hurt on her behalf. I felt like just for that poem, that she put it right there in the middle of the art. Um, it's really, I think, the only that I saw of all these poems. I mean, they're, they're all, I think, amazing. And they're much better than whatever's next door in the Alice stuff. Lots of books out there. But this is, this is really, the, the, I think, the, the, the only great modernist Yiddish poem that we have on, on a tombstone. Um, Wait, so this, and she rescues that from, you know, this... Yeah, but this isn't the one on there, you're right. Right, but this is not on the tombstone. No, the one that's on the, the tombstone is, is the best one. Right? I think, I mean, the one on the tombstone is the little one in the middle oh, of the page. Oh, and I think those first two lines, not only are they great, she with the cold marble breast and the, and the um, or breast, I wait, guess it should wait, be. Wait, let's clarify. The, the cold marble breast is, on, is not on the tombstone. Those two lines are not on the tombstone. Okay. And I have no idea why. And they're, and uh, it doesn't she make sense to me that it was censored. Yeah, the why do they keep getting rid of the first two lines? The poem, it, it, you, need, you need that. First of all, you need it for the meter, for the rhythms. It's fascinating. It's she got she got screwed by the editor, whoever the editor was. Oh, wait, you, you, you go ahead. You, I'm sorry, not being clear. I'm totally confused because if the epitaph is on the tombstone, this is more than two lines. It starts with a zimot. It starts with zimot. Er shenkat v'shvent of mist of corners. If you're gonna, um, first of all, if you're gonna censor anything, that's what you want to censor. Yeah. And by the way, this. The fact that there's three stanzas, every stanza ends with Gornish during my spell check, Garnish. Um, Zog Gornish, Zog Gornish, and Gornish, of Gornish, of Gornish, as, a, as a, a, a weak rhyme. You know, in other words, it's considered a bad rhyme to use the same word. That's a, a, a trick. And this is a woman who was capable of producing a very good rhyme. Um, and to have the you say nothing, you know, you passerby say nothing. By the way, I feel like you, Diana, you must know. The passerby say nothing, that's like a famous, she stole that from something in Westminster Avenue. I just, if I had a little more time, I could find it on Google. The passerby say nothing is a trope. She stole that. But no one else says, I'm nothing, and you say nothing. I mean, and to, to rhyme those two nothings, is a, is a clever way of saying, okay, I'm nothing, but you're nothing too. The nothing is on both sides of this tombstone. Um, so, okay, this is my just plug for, for Adam Margolin, if there was like a, a, a literary prize for Epitaphs. Do we have to run? Give me one more minute. So, don't I have another minute? Or five yeah. minutes, right? Read us yours. Ziegelbun. I have to read it. First of all, I should say that Ziegelbun's tombstone uh, contains a huge tombstone. It's the it's at the edge of the corner of the new Mount Carmel. Um, it was he died in '43, but it was uh, it was erected. I wrote this down, but no, I didn't write it down. In the late '40s or maybe even early '50s, because I think it was probably the early '50s, because the whole cemetery starts with '51. Um, so, uh, and who was Eagleblind? But he was from South Africa and uh, he went to England to plead the case of the Warsaw Ghetto. And England or? He was a, a, he was from Poland, he was a, he was a Polish Bundes, Polish Jewish Bundes. Yes. And he went to the, basically the London Poles. I mean, not only, not only the regular government, but the, the government of Poland at that point was in He was in the, in the Polish government in exile. Yeah. Um, which had a Bundist representative. The Bundists, by the way, right before the war, for the first time got a majority of Jewish representation in, was it the Sem or the Polish? 
I forget where, but the, the Buddhists were at their political height in the late 30s for various reasons. And he somehow ended up in Poland, in, in London during the war. He was in Polish parliament exile, couldn't persuade them to take real action on what was going on in Warsaw. In protest, he committed suicide and asked to be cremated, which is actually something that, um, and he asked to be cremated in, in, in 1943 in his suicide note, um, already knew that cremate, in solidarity with um, the others. And um, the, by the way, this notion of being cremated in solidarity with the ovens is, is he wasn't the only one. There was, there was a lot of people choosing cremation. I have a, a cousin who's a conservative rabbi who's going to be cremated. And I think you probably know that cremation is frowned upon in, in the Jewish tradition. And even among secular Jews, it's seen with some, you know, residual, they don't like to do it. And there's people who are doing it so deliberately. So his ashes were brought from London after the war. He was buried with ceremony, and his tombstone is basically from his suicide note, not the entire suicide note, but a lot of it. So there's a picture of it here. There's a lot of text on it. It has four sides. I think you can see it. It's basically the first, uh, Rossi says it's the first Holocaust memorial in America. Um, and it's, it's got this eternal light, so um, in stone. And his niece lives in San Francisco. Oh. Arctic. What's her name? Arctic. Oh. Uh, so here's just a few parts of it that I could read from the English. I didn't do the Yiddish. It wasn't so easy to read. Um, but it's, it's a translation from the Yiddish. I, I think he wrote his suicide note in Yiddish, and, and it was translated into English. So it says, my comrades in the Warsaw Ghetto fell with arms in their hands in their last heroic battle. It was not given to me to die together with them, but I belong to them and to their mass grave. By my death, I wish to express my strongest protest against the passivity with which the world observes and permits the extermination of the Jewish people. Um, so, oh, and it says, died May 11, 1943, in London, chose martyr's death. So... I, you know, there's a lot to say about this. I just, I, I don't have a literary analysis of it. It's just a, a, a moving. But I would point out a couple of things, which is that this, you know, this notion chose Marta's death, and you know, just, you know, uh, died al kiddush Hashem. Um, so it's a a, a, a a reclamation of a very powerful religious symbol, um, symbol concept, and it, it interestingly. I mean, the two people who were brought over from far ways, Aaron Lieberman, one suicide, the pioneer, and Ziegel, Ziegelbein from London, another suicide, who are treated as kind of sacred figures. So there is a kind of secular, sacred space here. And I think that's even more evident in the New Mount Carmel Cemetery, which, in which the great socialist slogans, I won't get into it, we don't have any more time, are really replaced in a lot of places with... Um, uh, mention of the Holocaust of the Warsaw Ghetto, lots of people who are mentioned who are not actually buried there, who died in, 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 in Europe, and who are mostly Poland, um, and uh, it, it becomes a kind of memorial, especially to Buddhism um, in Poland, um, and, and, and that's what the new Mount Carmel Cemetery is, and is a, a, a kind of double message that these two cemeteries together provide one that really doesn't face death directly or or you know which the the international bakers union is my eternal home versus one that's really very preoccupied not only with individual death but the death of the culture so go visit make a pilgrimage thank you, thank you. between the, you said the communists were throwing eggs, what was the <laughs> position between